So welcome to the afternoon sessions. Our first speaker is Nicolas Kuhabt from Data Convolution. Nicolas studied mathematics in Germany and in the United States. And he got passionate about the topics of big data and data science during his master thesis. He then worked as a big data consultant and later changed to Fraunhofer IEE to work as a research data scientist. And beginning in 2020, he worked as a freelancer in data science. He is now talking. His talk title is Probabilistic Forecasting with Deep AR and Amazon Web Services SageMaker. So, Nicolas, please start sharing your slides and let's start. Thanks for the nice introduction. Um, I hope you guys had a great break. And yeah, my name is Nicolas Kuhaupt. I join you from Germany, the wonderful city of Kassel. And I'm a freelance data scientist. I like forecasting time series. And about a year ago, I read about this uh, forecasting algorithm, which is called Deep AR. It was published by Amazon Research. And I got into the algorithm and it has some nice features. So, so I thought it would be nice to, to give a talk about it. So first question arises, do we actually need yet another forecasting algorithm? And I would claim, yes, um, the deep AR algorithm has it, its right to exist because, um, as, I, as I already said, it has some nice features. And I think the combination of features uh, the algorithm has makes it really unique. And um, yeah, it, it should be in the toolbox of, of a Danish data scientist. So let's first understand what this algorithm actually is, what are the features I talked about. So first, this one is already in the title. We have probab probabilistic forecasting. Just imagine I would tell you tomorrow it's going to be sunny. And that's a forecast and you are happy and you leave your umbrella at home. And then another time I tell you tomorrow it's going to be sunny with a probability of 60%. So that's now a different information. You may not leave your umbrella at home if, if you know that it's likely only 60%. And the point is that putting probabilities to our forecast really adds value to our forecast. It's not about the forecast itself, but um, saying how likely the forecast actually is, and also to give some boundaries in which the forecast may lie. So that's like the, the big feature of deep AR. There are also other algorithms like uh, the ARIMA and regression models, which can do it, um, but not, for example, if you know um, deep learning, the LSTMs, which are neural networks, they cannot do it, at least not out of the box. Okay, another point is the automatic feature engineering. That's basically what you have when you use neural networks. Okay, so you put in the features into the neural network and the neural network somehow models the input in a way that it automatically generates some features. And then we see that the plain LSTMs which are neural networks, they can also do it, but not our classical approaches like ARIMA regression models and so on. And the last one is also quite unique to deep AR. It says we train one algorithm for multiple time series. Okay, so our problem setting is we do not only have one time series, but multiple time series, which should be related in some way. Um, yeah, but, but they obviously can, can differ. And 
I don't know any approaches, classical approaches to forecasting, which already cover this, uh, that, that one algorithm learns all time series. Um, there are some concepts which, which do something similar, like meta learning. Meta learning is where you want to learn how to optimize. Okay, so you take one time series, you learn how you can optimize this time series. And then when you have another time series, you already know how to optimize uh, time series and then you can apply this optimization technique. Mm -hmm. Transfer learning is similar, but uh, it, it, not, it does not transfer the optimization strategy, but more like the knowledge. Okay, so you can think of um, an algorithm which you have already trained and it has some cool patterns detected and those patterns would also be nice for another time series and then you you transfer this knowledge this is transfer learning um, yeah but but our deep ar algorithm uh, does it a little bit different way we will see soon understand like the intuition behind it if I talk about the advantages, I also have to talk about the disadvantages. What is bad about this algorithm? This basically applies to every neural network. It's time and resource intensive to train. So it's not like you get your results in a minute. Um, and also there are some hyperparameters to set, which are not intuitive, I would say. And, um, you either need a lot of experience to, to set them correctly or uh, you just have to, to try and uh, tune it in, in iterations. So, and this also goes together with the first point that it's re resource intensive. So it, it takes some time and you, you cannot set a hyperparameters correctly at the first time. So that might be a long circle of improvements. Okay. Let's, let's briefly understand how it works, just in concept, no, no deep math. We have our time series. Time series here is the X in, in the lower part at the bottom. We give our X uh, as the input to our first uh, neural network. That's the neural network is like the middle part of it. Okay. And uh, we, we basically know this from, from LSTMs. For, for those of you who are familiar with LSTMs, if you're not, it's, it's not important. But the point is our network has as an output not the prediction, but the parameters of a probabilistic function. Okay, so let's take an example. We have the Gaussian probabilistic function. And the Gaussian has two parameters, um, the mean value and the standard deviation. Those are the two parameters which determine the probability function. Okay? If we have those two parameters, our probability function is, is clear. So, and what's, what this neural network now does is it gives us the parameters for the probability function. Okay? So output from the network is the mean and the standard deviation, okay? And then we are in the top layer, which is here L, L is our probability function. And then we can just sample from the probability function, right? So if we have the uh, normal distribution, we, we sample from the normal distribution and we get some value. And this is actually our forecast yeah so that that's important to remember we don't the, the network doesn't put out the prediction itself with the parameters for the probability function then we see we, we we sample from those probability functions that's basically z okay that's the sample and you see the dotted line going from z down to the next input again. That's where the autoregressive, in, in the name of deep AR, AR means autoregressive. 
that's where it comes from. You just put the, the sample back in the input again. Okay. Now, uh, one more remark. If we talk about multiple time series, you can see here's only one X which you have as an input for the network. Now we want to handle multiple time series. How do we do it? Well, basically you have this one architecture. This one architecture you train with every time series, but you have to scale it before, before you put it into the network. Okay, so that's the, the crucial part. Scale your input and you're good to, uh, to have it as an input for the network. Okay. One last remark is that if we sample our Z at the top, um, then we have just one, one prediction. Now, as we are sampling, we can sample multiple Zs, okay? And this is basically what gives us our probabilities. So imagine we sample at the, at the first time step, we sample once, put it back into the input, sample the second example, and then in the third uh, time step, uh, and sample the third Z. So now we repeat it and we get multiple values for Z1, multiple values for Z2, and so on. And let's say we have sampled 1,000 samples. Now we can uh, make the, the boundaries and say, like, what's the probability of uh, the prediction being in this uh, corridor? OK, so sampling multiple times lets us know the probabilities and give boundaries to, to our prediction. OK. Now, where can you apply it? Um, and here I have listed just some sample data sets. Some are from the paper, some are from experience I, I read online. So I think sales at Amazon is maybe the most obvious one because uh, the, the paper was published by Amazon. And you could imagine like every item in the Amazon store is just uh, one time series. And then you have multiple categories or multiple time series and every one you want to forecast. And you could also imagine by having only one architecture, one neural network, that somehow the time series will learn from each other, right? So you forecast one time series and by, by training on this time series, it will also learn about the other time series. The second point, sales in stores. Um, I read about it, That's, that was quite interesting. Um, in Axel Springer Verlag, which is basically a, a media company which sells uh, magazines here in Germany. And they, they want to know that, like, how probable is it that magazines are running out of stock in a store, okay? And then every store would be a, a time series and somehow uh, they, they share some patterns which the algorithm can learn and then forecast every time series individually. Okay, the second one, forecasting load of servers in data centers, that's also Amazon. Um, they have the AWS, uh, the, the cloud service. And I think it makes sense for them to forecast what's the load going to be in the future so that they can provide more infrastructure and um, give some guarantees for, for providing the infrastructure. Okay, the last two examples are from the paper. Car traffic would be just watching one lane and see like how many cars pass by the lane. And then you have one lane is one time series and you can predict the traffic. And the last one, you have different households. Every household has its own energy consumption and Again, you can imagine they share some patterns, some similarities, but again, every household is, is different in a way. Okay, and the last one is also which I uh, um, trained the deep R AR algorithm with, um, which I used for experimenting. 
Okay, here we just have one sample how it looks like. Um, that's that's basic chart of the energy consumption, and you can clearly see the the daily patterns. I forgot the x axis, but um, yeah, at the night it it uh, it goes quite quite low the energy consumption, and then during the day it goes up again. And just to show you, we have multiple of them, right? So here we have eight, but I think in the total data set there are three hundred fifty households with their corresponding energy consumption. Okay. As I already said, the deep AR algorithm was published by Amazon and therefore they also integrated it into their system, into AWS. And their machine learning service, they call it SageMaker. SageMaker itself is again big, so it has a lot of components. What I used was the uh, SageMaker notebooks, so I just created a notebook and it's exactly the same as a Jupyter notebook as you know it. Okay, so you just give it an um, instance name that's like which server do you want to use behind the notebook and you can have like really big servers with GPUs or a small one and then also the costs they differ. What I also found quite interesting is the uh, crowd truth in the corner, in the left corner for labeling. Um, there they integrate the Mechanical Turk service, which is a platform for, for distributing uh, labor to, to people or small work packages to people. And you can use this platform with Crown Truth to label your data. Okay, so it will really be uh, provided to, to people to, to label your data and then you get your data labeled back. Of, of course, it, it costs something, not for free, but um, I think they, they do it quite um, cheaply. Okay, now let's, let's see what we have to do to get this deep AR algorithm running. Um, that's not to show you how to import in Python, that's just to show you what, you, what we will need for the deep AR algorithm. So first, there's Boto3. Boto3 is basically the Python SDK of AWS. Okay? Boto3 lets you access every service in, within AWS. Um, but here we have for two services, uh, we have extra imports. We have uh, in the second line, the S3 file system. That's the file system ser service by AWS. So the S3, S3 stands for um, simple storage service. Okay, so you can save whatever you want. And we need it here to save our results in the steps in between in S3. And then SageMaker, I already taught you about. What is interesting here is the execution role. Execution role is basically about the permissions. So we are in a notebook instance, and then we want to access S3, the storage. But who tells us if we are allowed to access the S3 storage? Or we want to deploy our algorithm to, to a server? Who tells us if we are allowed to, to do it? And Amazon has this uh, structure to to let the services um, play together with roles, okay? So a role is basically a policy which allows you certain things to do with other services. And in our notebook, we get the execution role and then we are allowed uh, to do whatever we uh, have as a, as a role for our notebook. Okay, and the last one, um, the AWS API is a little bit different to, to what we know from sklearn, for example. And the image URI is basically to tell our algorithm or to tell AWS which algorithm we want to use. Okay, so we don't import 
XGBoost, we don't import regression, but we get an image for our algorithm. Okay, then the interesting part is how do we need to prepare our data? And here again, it's, it's a little bit different. Normally we are used to pandas data frames. Here it is JSON lines. Every line, every JSON line is one time series. So in total, we see here three time series and we need to have at least two, two uh, parameters. We need the start, that's just the timestamp as a string um, where the time series starts. And then the, the second one we need is target and target is the time series itself. So that's what we want to forecast where we are interested in. Okay, then we have two optional parts. The first optional part is cat, which stands for category. Yeah, so you, you could imagine this is like a feature which, which tells uh, about the category of our time series. Let's say we have um, the energy households and then maybe we have different categories of households. Like the first one is a family home, the second one is a single home, and I don't know, maybe the third one has a Tesla, which is a different category like that. And then the last part, which is also optional, dynamic feed. Dynamic feed, which means dynamical feature. Um, this is an additional time series which gives information about our our target time series so you could imagine if we have the households we want to know the energy what would be a good dy dynamical feature maybe it would be the weather okay if it's if it's nice out, outside then maybe people go outside and don't use that much energy so we could include dynamic feature, the weather or the temperature, um, but we could also include multiple features, multiple time series. Here it is important that the length of this list in dynamical features, it has to be the same as our target, okay? So for every time point in target, we basically have additional information. Okay, then we have some um, hyperparameters which we need. Um, most of them are just what you know from, from neural networks. So the first one, time frequency. If you look back at the, at the preparation of our data, sorry, um, we, we just give it the start date, but it doesn't have the information about like how it, um, how it goes on. And here we have the hyperparameter time frequency, which just says hourly distance between the individual targets. Context length just means um, how much information want we, do we want to give in order to forecast. And here 72 is just three days. Okay, So we take three days to forecast, and that's the next parameter prediction length next 24 hours yeah. yeah i think uh, the other hyperparameters maybe gaussian this this is also interesting here we give it the probability function we want to use right i, I told you at the start where uh, we want to sample from mm. maybe one short note for for the likelihood function or probability function two things are important for choosing the probability function First, because you want to sample from it, you have to make sure that it's easy to sample from it. Otherwise, it, it will take a lot of resources. And second, you also need the gradient from the probability function. So make, make sure that you can uh, calculate the gradient from the probability function. Okay, otherwise it's, it's the same as we know from neural networks. Um, so let's see what we need for training them. First, we initiate a session. That's a SageMaker session. 
Then I told you about the execution role. That's where we get the permissions from. And then here last, you see the image URI. And here it says forecasting deep AR. So that's where we tell it which, which algorithm we want to use. Okay, and then we put the information together and we can start training. So we, we initiate an est estimator. We, we give it the session, the image name, the role. And what is also interesting, we give it um, the, the instance, the name of the instance we want to use. That's basically just a server, okay? And Amazon tells you how much the server costs. Um, and if, if you have a bigger one, training goes faster, but it's also more expensive. And I used the C4 X large. It costs about, I think, 45 cents per hour, okay? But training for the energy households, it took less than an hour. So I think I paid about 50 cents for, for the whole. Okay, and then the S3 bucket, um, that's where we save our uh, results. Okay, and, and in the last line, we just give it the parameters from, from the slides before. Okay. Now we start the fitting process or the training process. Um, here again, it looks a little bit different how we give the data to, to the fit. Um, we, we make it with S3 buckets. So in our S3 buckets, the data is saved as the JSON lines and we give it as a, as a parse name. Parse name. Yeah, so two minutes. Okay. So we give data channels to the estimator. We start the fit process and yeah, it, it works. So nothing more to do. What we have to do now at the end is to deploy it. Again, this is quite easy with AWS. You take the job name and you, you uh, tell SageMaker, make an endpoint. And this endpoint, there is the model deployed and you can basically query it, okay? So again, we have to give it an instance. Here it's a slightly uh, smaller server. And then there's the model deployed and you could, for example, use REST to query this model and give, get your predictions back. So this is quite clever. I think I, I, I think this approach is, is quite good. Okay, so what's left? Let's look in ex, at two examples. We again see the daily patterns and we see the 80% confidence interval. And we see that most of the time, the, the time series actually is within the 80% interval. And we also see that we have two different patterns here, but they are both quite well fitted. And the last one, again, slightly bit, little bit, little bit different patterns, but again, quite good fitted. And, and also in the last one, in the lower one, you see the weekly patterns, like five days, and then you have the two weekends here. Okay, and the two weekends are also uh, captured by, by the forecasting algorithm. Okay, this concludes my talk. Thanks for listening. Feel free to ask me questions afterwards. So thank you very much for your talk. Um, we have time for one or two questions quickly. <laughs> I see there are no questions yet in the Q&A section. I do have um, <laughs> two questions actually. One is not really related to the content of your talk. It's more, what's your setup? Did you have a screen screen? How did you do it? Yeah, okay, um, I, I can start my camera and then you should see oh, yeah, my... No. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's perfect. And you run the software with, with your that's, whole uh, screen? O o OBS. Oh, okay, so you go full screen and go share your screen. Okay, it's yeah. just not related to the talk. Um, I have another question now related to the talk. It's about deep AR. Mm -hmm. um, 
it's it's um it's a Amazon algorithm, but I saw there are some open source um, solutions too. Did you test yeah. them, and are they reliable? Um, so I, I did not test. I, I also saw them. They are by uh, implemented mainly in PyTorch, and I think one or two implementations are in TensorFlow, but I've not tested them. Okay, great. Thank you very much again. And if there are more questions, please go to the Discord channel. Um, just um, with command K, you can search forecast and then you will find the channel and then ask more questions to Nicolas. Okay, thank you very much again. Thank you.